We are live. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Township of Georgian Bay, the council meeting of Tuesday, August 11th at 10.07 a.m. And I would also like to acknowledge that we are on the lands traditionally occupied by the Indigenous peoples. They continue to care for this land. They continue to shape the Township of Georgian Bay today. And we want to show our respect. Hundreds of years after the first treaties were signed, they remain relevant today in guiding our decisions and our actions. Megwitch. With that, I'm gonna ask whether or not any of my um, fellow councillors have any declarations of pecuniary, pecuniary interest to make at this time. I'm seeing various heads shake, so I'm gonna take that as a no. And before we get into our delegations, I'm gonna ask for just one moment that we contemplate later on in our agenda, and it's gonna be item 10B, uh, a motion made by Councillor Hazelton. We've had a, a re resident ask if they can speak uh, to that matter themselves in response to the agenda that has been posted. And under normal circumstances, we do not allow uh, people to speak when there's not a declared public meeting. However, if council so wishes, we can make an exception. And I'm asking councillors if they would like to make an exception in this case. I'm sure you all received some of the correspondence last night and whether you would like to make an exception or not. I see one head shake negative. Did I see one hand go up? Councillor Cooper. I see a second head shake negative. Uh, Peter, I, I really couldn't support that because I think it's very uneven in terms of who we are allowing and who we don't allow. Uh, so I couldn't, I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't support that. Thank you. I'm open Thank to you. any transparency that we can have and any more information we can have, so I'll support it. Okay. Councillors Douglas and Bocek, I don't recall seeing your hands up or your head shaking. Do you wish to speak to this matter? I will, uh, <clears throat> I will uh, agree to allow uh, an outside party take part in this meeting. Okay. Councillor Douglas. Uh, I, I think, look, any transparency we can get is fine. You, you know, um, I understand the other councillors do not agree, however, or some don't, but I think I think anytime we get you know some input, it's it's, it's always good input to take on board. Okay. I'll agree. I, I do I do think through you, Mr. Mayor, that if the conversation gets out of hand or gets um, to a point of argument, I think possibly someone should step in and end it. Well, yes, I I think that that's a fair. Um, what what I'm seeing right now is three people in favor, three people against, um, and I'm going to make the decision in favor, tightly restricted. In other words, speaking to the topic at hand, and the topic at hand, in my opinion, is whether or not the MECP, uh, whether or not we ask the MECP to have their procedures and process reviewed. Um, and if, the, and if this, uh, the responses are not to that topic, then I will cut it off. Councillor Hazelton. I'd like to go on record and say that if you allow someone to speak in one side of this matter, you are jeopardizing the entire topic uh, by having an unbalanced representation. And uh, I think it would be very folly for our township to, uh, to think that we're engaging in transparency when in fact we are engaging in prioritizing uh, one side of an argument or a discussion versus another and I think it sets a very, very bad precedent. So I would like to make that, uh, put that on record. Uh, if you're going to allow a, somebody from the community to speak in a meeting like this, then you have to allow uh, basically both sides of a matter to be presented. And you are not going to be allowing that in the context of what you've presented. So I think that uh, this is a very dangerous statement. Councilor Douglas. Uh, Councilor Hazelton brings up a good point. I mean, where do we draw the line here on who speaks and who doesn't? I mean, I, we do have a format for people to speak. Are we talking about going through that format or 
is this just a special request? Council Jarvis. I think if we want to have a public forum on this, then we should uh, have the formal process for that at another date. Uh, this is just a proposal by Councillor Hazelton, and we should be just addressing that. Um, I find it, I'm finding this in a very, I, I will be quite honest with everybody that I'm finding this a little bit of an awkward discussion. And the main reason is I normally would like and we have a few times in the past allowed people to speak, even though it was not part of the formal format, because I'd like to counsel to hear um, input from our residents. Um, to Councillor uh, Hazelton's point, I'm, I don't. I am afraid I do not agree in that. Um, I believe Councillor Hazelton can present very well and very strongly. Uh, the reasons why he's put this proposal in front of us. Um, and I don't know, I, and I do not want the individual who wants to speak to, to say, get off topic. And I will certainly rein things in if, if she does. But I do believe giving her a few minutes to um, present, I'll call it, make sure her side of the story is also part of the consideration, I don't think is unreasonable but I think we have to tightly control it. Councillor Bocek, I saw your hand up. I think if we don't allow the individual to speak, then perhaps we should remove this item from the agenda until uh, we seek advice, whether we're following uh, procedures and protocols. Mr. Mayor, if you're comfortable that, uh, and, and Ms. Gumby, um, if you're both comfortable that we're following procedures here, then I think we can move ahead. But if there's any question, I think we should remove this item from the agenda and, and deal with that at a later date. That's my feelings. I'm not requesting. Clerk Way. Sorry, I just, just to clarify the procedures. So if we were to move forward and allow a member to speak in, in a non-traditional format, such as following a comment on new business, we would need to pass a formal resolution that would waive the rules of procedure that needs to be passed by a majority vote. If the decision is to remove the item 10B, Brandy's Cove, that would be done at the adoption of the regular agenda, which would just require a passing vote. Okay. Um, so two separate items, sorry. No, but that, that, that's, that's fair enough. I mean, you know, you know that I usually support a more, I'll call it casual approach, but I know you're very good at making sure we stay within the rules and regulations. Um, given that, why don't we wait until we are going to pass the agenda and continue discussion at that point? Because I think that uh, at the time of passing the agenda, we may have a little further discussion on whether that item will or will not be discussed. And following that discussion, um, we, we, if we want to formalize letting somebody speak, we'll make a motion at that time. I think it might be the, the better format under the circumstances. But I do appreciate everybody's input at this point, but I think maybe we'll just wait until the agenda appears and then we'll make a decision at that stage. All right. With that, I believe we have a number of delegations uh, to, that want to be made with regards to our... Sorry, Your Worship. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, we missed item three on the agenda to make a request for declaration of pecuniary interest. I did already ask that of our counselors. Did you? Okay. And, and everybody shook their head no. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I missed that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure everybody can shake their head in a negative form again if you, if you prefer. I trust you. Let's go to the delegations, please. And I don't know who is coordinating the delegations for us. So the first person we have speaking is Mr. Breckbill. And okay. he, there we go, we have his video. Uh, uh, can you hear me? I know I can. Yes, you can. Yes. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm in a very awkward Oh, now we can't hear you. Generator decided not to uh, <laughs> come on. So I'm sitting in my car 
And uh, if everyone can hear me, just tell me. Yes, we can. Okay. Well, good morning, Your Worship. I would like to thank you and Council for allowing me to speak this morning and make a request for funding on behalf of the Georgian Bay Township Historical Society. As you all know, the Historical Society over the past few years have been adding to and enhancing the Brissett Homestead Heritage Park. Our most recent endeavor being the moving and restoration of the David Mill and Wilderness Cabin, which features the restored interior and exterior, along with descriptive storyboards telling of Milne's time on Six Mile Lake. Along with moving the cabin there, <clears throat> the, the society constructed a brick pathway uh, surrounding the cabin along with some landscaping. Now it was our plan to continue with the pathways leading to the Petrocan Tim Horton Service Center and over to Lone Pine Road in order to make access to the waterfront park more available. Uh, this is still our plan, but like everything else since last March, projects have come to a halt, and we hope that by next year these projects will be back online. Of course, the featured building in the park is the Brissett House itself. Uh, she's gone, she's had a few rough years uh, after the Chamber and Muskoka Tourism moved out, and many of us have been, and, uh, have been trying to find an appropriate new use for the historic structure. Because of the uncertainty of its eventual use and what possible renovations may be needed, the house's everyday maintenance, particularly on the exterior, has been postponed, and now the house has a sad, neglected look. While there was funding set aside for renovations and maintenance a while back, the money was diverted to help fund the great project of relocating the Honey Harbor Library to the school and the renovations that were needed to accomplish this. Uh, the Historical Society proposes that we be given funding in the amount of $5,000 to arrange for us and supervise the much needed repairs and maintenance of the Bursette House exterior. The major items that need attention are <clears throat> the removal of the deck leading to the now closed public washrooms, restoration of the railings around the covered porch, repair to the wheelchair ramp, repairs to the siding, and painting of the exterior. I have been present with Brad Sokash at all meetings with the engineers and architects where possible uses and interior changes were discussed. I don't believe any of our proposed maintenance items would be counterproductive to the house's eventual use. It's historical society's hope that all projects will be resumed by next spring, and along with continued improvements to the park and the restoration of the exterior of the Brissett House, the park will be ready to welcome many tourists and travelers um, that even now frequent our historic park. So thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Council, for listening to me this morning. Any That's questions, I'd be happy to Happy to answer them. Mr. Breckville, thank you very much. Council, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Breckville? Councilor Yanko. I just have a, a question uh, to Brad. I guess he's on the line here. Um, is there money in the budget to do any renovations to the Bousset House uh, in 2021? Through the mayor at this time, uh, we don't have any money proposed for renovations to the Brissett House. And uh, I think the proposal by Mr. Breckville would be fantastic to get it back into good aesthetic shape. Any other questions? Could you confirm for me, Mr. Breckville, the, the amount of the ask? $5,000. Okay. I, it, it seemed quite a modest amount given what you're proposing to do. So I just wanted to confirm the amount. Thank you. The reason that I am only asking for that amount is because uh, we do plan to do additional um, enhancement to the park with uh, paths, pathways and such. And we do have a fairly good budget left for that within the historical society. So we felt that the $5,000, even though it's modest, would uh, boost our budget enough that spending some of the money that we have left over 
combined with the 5,000, we think we could do it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I know that uh, Ms. Boutsiet, our uh, treasurer, is taking note of all this, and uh, I'm sure this will be uh, on, on her list when council's contemplating the budget in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now, if my listing is correct, uh, Mr. Hutcherson from the Cognizant Community Church, I believe is our next uh, speaker. Mr. Hutchison, please go ahead. Aaron, Aaron could you uh, ask to put my video back on? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you to the mayor and council for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Cognizant Community Church. We were in the process of establishing a fundraising committee when we were made aware of the availability of these funds less than 24 hours from the cutoff time for submission, which was Tuesday at four o'clock. Understandably, we did not want to pass up on this opportunity. Between the application and my email to Ms. Gumby, we have a lot of information and I thought I would summarize the salient points in quick order. The church was established in 1906 with services held at local cottages. Dress code was Sunday best. We too have a dress code today, but Sunday best is your best t-shirt and your best pair of shorts. The history of the church is also featured in the book, Wind, Water, Rock, and Sky, the story of Cognizant. In the early 1950s, the Louis Brightup and his wife donated a half acre lot on the Freddie Channel, thus starting a permanent location. As we do today, ministers who cottaged in the area or were guests of cottagers would lead the worship, providing the congregation with the diversity of a different different Christian non-denominational service each week for July and August. In the late 1990s, the church acquired the property to the east of the original property, thus allowing the church to have more space for dockage and to establish the tran Tranquility Garden. The garden has a stone wall with brass plaques mounted on it for individuals who families or friends wanted them to be remembered in this quiet place. You do not have to be a member of Cognizant only have a connection to Cognizant to go into the garden, and you do not have to be a member of the church. Designed for reflection and solitude, the wall now contains 127 plaques, and it will soon be necessary to build another section of the wall. The church is a fixture on the Freddie Channel. Ask any boater or cottager, and they know where, quote, the church on the Freddie, unquote, or, quote, church on the rocks, unquote, is located. The church draws between 70 to 120 people on any given Sunday during July and August to an open air service. The church is and has been used for weddings, baptism, family reunions, Cognizant Cottagers, CCA, AGM, CPR training session, all candidates meetings during election years, children's rec program, canoe trip staging area, and much, much more. As we mentioned in the application, the church can be thought of as Cognizant's town hall. Only difference with our town hall is it doesn't have a roof. We are dealing with a safety concern to make sure our participants have safe and secure access to our property, but more importantly, an environmental crisis. Our docks were examined by an expert this summer and structurally they might last five years but we have deteriorating unencapsulated polystyrene foam as flotation in our docks. And the PS foam is simply falling apart due to age aided by wildlife. In our email, we included a supporting letter from the Georgian Bay Forever, which is a must read for every cottager with a dock, which means everybody in Cognizant. The letter outlines the harmful effects of PS foam. We have 280 feet of dock eight feet wide to be replaced over the next three to five years or sooner if we can raise the fund. Seven sections, 40 feet long. In conclusion, we have a large uphill struggle to gather funds to replace our docks over the planned time period. We will pass the plate to individuals and organizations inside and outside the church. As the township knows with COVID-19, 
These are difficult times to gather funds, but we need your help in getting to our goal. Your assistance over the next three to five years would be a huge step in the right direction to improving the environment and assisting the Cognition continue to have its town hall. Thank you for your time. Mr. Hutchinson, thank you very much. Did you, um, I'm afraid I've forgotten, did you quantify your ask in your application or are you open to any amount? We're open to any amount, the more the better. I'm not if surprised you, for that part. If, if you uh, do the math very quickly that we need seven sections on a 40 foot dock with uh, even plastic tubing, you're looking somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 to $15,000. So you're looking at $105,000, um, which is an astronomical number. And that's why I say any help. We, some sections will, two sections will have to be metal uh, tubing because they will be against the shoreline or close to the shoreline. The remainder can be plastic tubing. Okay, thank you. Councilors, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Hutchins? Councilor Wienko. Again, I was just wanting from Brad. Um, occasionally we have um, somewhat lightly used docks, so some docks that we uh, take out that may be still functional. Do we have any of those coming up in the next uh, three to five years? Through the mayor, unfortunately, I don't anticipate us having any that are in reasonable shape in the next several years. Any other questions? I'm seeing no hands raised. So Mr. Hutchinson, thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Next to my list, I have Mr. Bywater from the Georgian Bay Biosphere. Good morning. Honorable Mayor Kutzier and members of council. My name is David Bywater and I am the conservation program manager at the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve. I am joined today by my executive, oh, start video. All right, sorry, I'm pausing to start video. You just been asked to do that. Sorry about that. I'll just start again from the beginning. My name is David Bywater, and I am the Conservation Program Manager at the Georgian Bay Biosphere Reserve. I am joined today by our Executive Director, Becky Pollock, and our Climate and Energy Specialist, Benjamin John. We are grateful for this opportunity and appreciate your support of the climate action work that we facilitate in municipalities and First Nations along Eastern Georgian Bay. We are very happy with the progress of ICECAP, that is the Integrated Community Energy and Climate Action Plans Partnership that we currently coordinate for our region. Our 2021 budget request to deliver climate action in your township is an extension of the work you approved last year. So I will take a few minutes to provide you with a progress update. First, you signed an MOU to become a full member of ICECAP, showing your support for collaboration among area councils within the Biosphere region. Your annual membership fee supported the administration, communications, and coordination of that initiative among six municipalities, and we expect more to join next year. Second, we developed a carbon calculator tool for residents and businesses to measure their carbon emissions and show reduction over time. This 15-minute survey, available online and in paper, is a made in GBPR tool that aligns well with the Partners for Climate Protection goals and is one of the only calculators to account for re recreational emissions from boats, snowmobiles, ATVs, and other engines. We are hopeful that at least 250 residents in your township will participate in the survey, and we will be running a draw for restaurant gift certificates during September for those who participate. Third, we have developed a public information brochure about climate change in Georgian Bay, specific impacts and changes we are seeing, and a checklist for residents and businesses to take climate action. Our State of the Bay blog series, as well as some recent webinars, highlights changes such as ticks and Lyme disease spreading north, as well as the increased frequency and severity of storms and how we need to adapt. This brochure will be printed in August for wide distribution. Finally, we had planned to build a community vegetable garden with you, but with COVID-19 and direction from your staff have deferred the project a year. However, we did apply for a grant of $8,000 to support its construction at the Baxter Ward Community Center. Food gardens help to reduce emissions from food transport and have numerous physical and mental health benefits. We are able to offer small, safe workshops to new gardeners, as well as webinars and other learning resources. Construction is now planned for April 2021. Today, we would like to respectfully request an extension of this community-based climate action work with a $10,000 contribution in 2021. 
we are proposing to deliver specific community climate action initiatives that will help to reduce carbon emissions, save money, and build community resilience. Individually and together, these initiatives have a high return on investment. They are detailed in our budget request form, but fall into three main categories. Carbon calculator, developing strategies for individuals and businesses based on the carbon emission results from the carbon calculator tool in terms of transportation, building performance and waste. Number two, shoreline resilience, helping residents adapt to high water and storm events with knowledge about future climate scenarios, best practices for shoreline management and resilient vegetation types for climate future. Number three, the ICECAP partnership. To maintain membership in this cultural initiative, support the overall cost of administration, grant writing, and ICECAP communications. Each of these proposed climate actions align with the Township of Georgian Bay's Climate Change Action Plan, which requires community partners like the Georgian Bay Biosphere to educate, inspire, and implement. We will continue to partner with Sustainable Severn Sound under the Severn Sound Environmental Association. There is a need to support both corporate municipal operations as well as grassroots community climate action. Our goal is to work with permanent and seasonal residents, businesses, and communities to reduce carbon emissions, save money, and build long-term resilience. We kindly request $10,000 to deliver on the proposed scope of work. We will work with township staff and council, ratepayers, and community groups to prioritize, schedule, and deliver on these actions, and showcase the Township of Georgian Bay's climate action throughout the Biosphere region. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Bywater, and your unseen colleagues that are in the room with you. <laughs> Social distance apart. Yes. Understood. Um, Council, any questions? Council Douglas, followed by Council Rianco. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your your presentation. David, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned something about a community garden and a grant. Uh, was that something that did come through for you or just out of curiosity? Were you able to obtain that? It is pending. It's pending, okay. And your plan, I, I'm, I'm just not sure. Did I just hear that you said only for um, the Baxter Ward Community Center or for other areas in the township, i.e. MacTier? Uh, yeah, that is that specific proposal is for the Baxter Ward and it's planned for construction in April. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councilor Rianco. Uh, David, thank you for the presentation. Um, are, are you working uh, with the SSEA on some of your climate change uh, uh, work because uh, uh, they're providing us with climate change information and carbon, uh, uh, carbon uh, emission reductions and so on. And I hate to see any duplications going on between your group and their group. So are uh, you working with them so we get uh, <clears throat> one, one service and not have any? Most definitely. We've been partnered with SSS and now both SSS and SSEA for well over a year and have a very clear understanding of how each of us are progressing on this work. Their focus is more on that corporate municipal. And then we're picking up the community actions that were recommended in your municipal climate change action plan. So no duplication, but lots of synergies and partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jarvis, did, or Councilor Jarvis, did I see your hand up? Uh, no, I, I'm fine. I uh, appreciate the report. Any, any other questions for Mr. Bywater at this time? Well, thank you very much. Uh, again, I, I know I know that our uh, director of finance is uh, taking notes as everyone speaks. So uh, your your application is absolutely has been noted and will be included in her presentation. Please open the iRobot Home app for help. Through you, Your Worship, I would just like to. Um, do a little preamble before the SSEA delegation. Certainly. We put the SSEA delegation um, last because it's kind of separate. We already have an agreement, uh, which is a, uh, you know, a municipal joint um, corporation, which we're, we are on the board. Therefore, they're not like uh, arm's length uh, third party. They are, um, you know, 
kind of jointly operated uh, mm -hmm. by the Township of Georgian Bay along with other municipalities. So um, there is an agreement on hand um, to continuously fund their operations. So um, I just wanted to put that little um, sidebar there to make sure that we understand that it's not, uh, it's, it's a little bit different than the, organ the other organizations that we've heard of today. In other words, we have a contractual agreement with them in place where the other organizations we do not. That's correct. Okay, thank you. With that, Ms. Cayley, thank the you, your screen worship. is yours. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, Your Worship, members of council and staff for the opportunity today. Um, as uh, I was, was just mentioned by the other Julie, uh, we've been your Joint Municipal Service Board under the Municipal Act since 2009 and providing a host of environmental services. Um, and you have access to our eight, uh, currently eight full-time experts as well through that agreement. Um, I also want to have a special thank you to Councillor Wyanko, who has been your uh, representative on our board um, and is our vice chair. So um, we are very pleased to have Councillor Wyanko on board with, uh, particularly with all of his expertise in environmental uh, as well. We've been committed to our member municipalities and our partners with our exceptional science-based services. Um, as you know, like everybody else, we have been experiencing some challenges this year with uh, changing the way we do business. And in light of that, as you'll note in the submission that we did put forward, our board is currently reviewing our budget based on the COVID-19 impacts on both our operations, our budget needs, um, and those sorts of things. So what you have in, head in front of you is approved in principle. Our board is meeting the end of this month uh, to review and um, revise the budget. Uh, and obviously we'll get that to you as soon as, as it is complete and approved by our board. Um, and like, like I mentioned, we've been experiencing significant impacts. I can speak to those more if you have questions about them, but I'm gonna just highlight a few things out of, out of our submission. Um, we've adapted our programming significantly to ensure that we're still monitoring changes in water quality throughout the Severn Sound watershed, like we've been doing since the late, uh, sorry, early 80s, including expanding our citizen science program. So engaging a lot of your, uh, your municipal um, residents in more significantly uh, and um, uh, outreach and online services. So we also have, uh, for some of us who are, let's just say over 20, it's been a bit uncomfortable getting used to doing online YouTube videos um, and doing different ways of uh, getting extension services out. So we now do have a YouTube uh, channel and you're welcome to visit uh, our, our, our videos and, and information as well there. And we do our training for uh, citizen scientists there as well. And I just wanna take this second to say, if anybody has folks or you yourselves are interested in engaging in some of the, our new citizen science programs, in particular, we're looking for folks who would uh, help us do temperature monitoring uh, out in the lakes and the bay. So please just get in touch with us um, as well. Um, sustainable Severin Sound is a big change for us. So uh, in the past, that's been a separate organization that has come to you for a grant. Um, as you have noticed in 2020, we started integrating that organization within SSEA, and we were doing that really under the request of our municipal partners for a whole number of reasons. We were able this year, uh, through a whole bunch of, of uh, reasons that we've mentioned in the letter, we were able to pass on a fairly significant savings in a, from our original budget request to you. Um, uh, so we were able to reduce that ask uh, and ask for it separately again as a special project. But that program, like you've already raised, is, is uh, certainly working in partnership with the ICECAP program, but is really focused on the partners in climate protection work uh, that's specific to your municipal emissions. And we're happy to have Tracy back on board with us to make sure that we move that piece forward. We're also going to be um, expanding our work on shoreline resilience with that program as well. As you all know, the water levels are significant and causing some significant stress and most, if not all, of our shoreline municipalities. So uh, we hope to be able to use that program and capacity to expand our work in that area. Um, also of note, the source protection program. So we are your source protection authority and risk management official. That still is not a direct cost to your municipality. It's paid through the district. Um, and just wanted, my staff wanted to say a big thank you to your staff who have been very proactive in a way they've been working with us uh, lately on that program. So it's been um, it's been really good for our staff working with you. 
I'm guessing because of some of the conversation before the meeting started, um, the uh, invasive species program is obviously on everybody's mind. Gypsy moth has been a significant issue throughout the watershed. Um, certainly in some cases more than others, the defoliation issues have been very significant. Um, and as Councillor Wayanko pointed out, he has asked at our board level that our staff look into more of the aerial spraying options available and those sorts of things. So we will be putting a staff report together um, and working with Councillor Wayanko on that piece. I do want to note there's been some other invasive species issues this year that uh, are slightly different than usual and that's um, there's been a significant snail die-offs and those would be invasive snails. So zebra mussel, quagga mussel and a, a fairly new snail, the uh, Chinese mystery snail. It's quite a large uh, snail and you can't miss it if you see them they move very quickly and they're quite large but we're seeing die-offs in a lot of our inland lakes so we're paying careful attention to that and um, I've created some some fact sheet information on those as well so we're certainly seeing uh, with people at home more more observations from the community um, and that's really helping us know what's going on out there and what we should be able to help focus on with your municipalities uh, the honey harbor area monitoring water quality monitoring program is going to be is continuing this year, but in a in a slightly different um, approach. Currently, the public labs are still closed, uh, so we are not able to do the water quality work, the chemistry work at the moment. We are going to be continuing with lake profiles, phytoplankton and zooplankton sampling, so that we can continue to know what changes are happening in the water quality. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that. I know we've got uh, tons of information in the let letter, and I imagine there may be some questions. Um, when you look on the third page of that letter, that's really the summary of the request, again, um, as it was put forward, approved in principle by our board. Um, and the total request, because you've often asked me um, from last year, is less than a 2% uh, increase at this time. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. Ms. Kelly, thanks. Thank you very much for your presentation. Council, anybody raising their hand? Councilor Jarvis. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate uh, the work the SSEA has been doing. Um, something that's come to mind uh, with conversations with people around here on our island is the, um, and particularly with regards to climate change and the sudden uh, downpours we've been getting is concern over uh, sewage output from the small towns uh, around the lake, uh, particularly Severn Sound, I think of Midland and Penetang. Does SSEA work with uh, those um, uh, communities with regards to how they may um, improve or change or whatever the uh, overflow that occurs when we get these sudden downpours from their sewage systems. Uh, through you, your worship to Councillor Jarvis, um, we do. Uh, we, in the uh, early days of the remedial action plan, uh, many of those sewage treatment plants were able to access significant dollars for upgrades, um, in particular Elmville, which is on the Y River. Uh, and Penetang as well. Um, you may know that Midland right now is in a fairly significant construction phase downtown trying to reduce both infiltration into their stormwater um, and their stormwater overflow. So they are trying to modernize that infrastructure. So we do work with them to provide some of those, the ideas and options um, and to help them with um, uh, applications for funding so that we can certainly provide what, what the water quality data is showing us out in the open water. We aren't seeing significant negative impacts uh, at this time in terms of uh, up until last year with those uh, overflows that they do have to report. My other understanding is, and I'm assuming it's, I haven't checked it myself this year, but as of last year, I believe both Midland and Penetang had um, working uh, with some ideas from our staff had switched to a more real time reporting so that you could go on their website rather than read about it in the newspaper if they'd had an overflow. Um, you can go on and see if there's been uh, those two sorts of overflows have happened. Uh, you know, it's certainly a challenge with the, the change in storm structure, I guess, that we're getting and the, the intense rainfall events. Um, Penetang has a very significant treatment system. So usually there what's overflowing is, uh, is a treated final effluent. Um, so much less to be worried about uh, there, but we're certainly um, work with and open to working with all of those municipalities as they work to, uh, you know, try to get the funds to do what they need to do to in, you know, upgrade their infrastructure. Sorry, Councilor Jarvis, you have a subsequent? 
sorry. Uh, ah, where am I? You got me now? Um, yeah, just subsequent. Uh, Julie, thank you. Is there a way of summarizing what's going on with those communities for uh, in one of your newsletters, just so people are more aware of what's going on? I, um, I was unaware, totally unaware of Penetang's uh, development over the years. And I knew that Midland was under construction because I know I can't get down the main street. I did not know why. Um, so yeah, that type of information, if it was more uh, available to the community, might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Council, Council Rianco. Uh, thank you. While you're on the, while you're on the line, um, maybe take this opportunity to ask you to maybe update uh, Council on the uh, blue, green, blue green algae uh, issues you've had in the area. Thank you, through your work. Um, so we've uh, recently, uh, as of I believe uh, over the weekend, I know one of our staff is working on responding to a report, um, I believe up closer to uh, Georgian Bay Township. What's What usually happens uh, in, in many of our inland lakes now that our municipalities are, are getting to know those, this, that we have the skill set in-house to do the early identification of blue-greens um, and determine whether or not A, it's a blue-green and B, if it's a potentially toxic blue-green. Um, we are seeing more reporting directly to us, but often those reports go directly to Ministry of Environment and the Health Unit, particularly if there's the potential that it's a blue-green, um, as you know, because then uh, it becomes a, certainly a, a health unit uh, uh, interest. Um, we are seeing, uh, actually this year we saw earlier blue-green blooms than normal, uh, likely due to the intense heat that we were having um, and low winds. Um, and uh, we're seeing sort of a maintenance of those. Uh, some, in some cases, they've dissipated and um, some not so much. So um, I would suggest it's not significantly different than last year, but it's occurring, it was occurring earlier this year than uh, we were normally seeing. Um, as well, I know that uh, you, Councillor Wang, who had sent us a photo yesterday um, and, you know, we're having looked into that particular photo without, again, without looking at things under a microscope, um, are, we're seeing a fair number of those blob uh, that sort of come from the bottom blob looking uh, algae that are a green filamentous algae. So they're a nuisance, but not necessarily uh, something that's going to be toxic or cause people harm. Hopefully that answered your question. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, and, and Julie, thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to follow up on comments uh, from Councillor Jarvis, specifically related to Penetang and Midland. You covered uh, Penetang as being uh, less problematic, I think is the way you described it, um, but Midland, uh, not so much, but they're working on it. The question is, when are they gonna be completed? Their work on the main street, but otherwise, and, um, What's your assessment in terms of the town of Midland and, and what sort of pollution we're gonna see from them in five and 10 years? Thank you. Through your worship, uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Cooper. Um, I certainly can't speak to the timelines uh, that Midland's on for their infrastructure development. Um, you know, that certainly would fall within, uh, I, I assume their budget and their, their infrastructure piece. And I know they do have some uh, new staff and they've done some restructuring. so. I know they're certainly focused on doing that work. Um, you know, from our standpoint, we're pleased to see the attention being paid to the potential to reduce stormwater actually overflowing uh, or over, uh, using the capacity of the sewage treatment plant that is meant for sewage treatment. Um, and they certainly have to plan for extra capacity as they're doing their development. Um, so that's that would be the way I could answer that at this time. Councillor Cooper, subsequent? Just, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm all trying to understand with the town of Midland, for example, Julie, um, is that to the fire? Um, you're sort of sounding like it's up to them. And I sort of get it, but I think uh, I would see the role of SSEA as one trying to make sure that these um, um, actions and pollutions that we see from time to time in these uh, two towns are not repeated in the future. So can you answer as to 
what sort of influence you have with them. Thank you. Thank you, through your worship. Um, you know, we, we are not a regulator, and um, uh, I guess in some cases that's good or bad. Um, and uh, uh, like any municipality, including yours, any of our partners, we are in a position where we provide comment on any of their de development applications that they, they put forward to us. Um, in the case of anything that falls within one of their drinking water protection zones, that is mandatory that those come to us. Um, so we are commenting and they do ask us for comment on their development uh, as they're moving those pieces forward. And like I mentioned before, we certainly, um, you know, work with them to try to help them with the capacity to do the improvements they need specifically around uh, those larger scale infrastructures. But um, the regulation for those fall well without our outside of our purview, definitely within Ministry of Environment. Um, and, you know, if it, it helps with your comfort level, the Ministry of Environment staff do work with us as well when they have questions about um, water, open water quality results and uh, impacts and that sort of thing. All right, thank you very much. Any other hands raised at this point? Seeing none, I'm gonna, oh. Councilor Bocek, the last minute, moment. Thanks very much for the presentation, Julie. And I've been listening to your um, your report and and your um, your workings with other agencies intrigues me. Um, for the purpose of this meeting, we were addressing uh, funding, and I'm not sure that we we heard an amount. I know that you said that. Uh, we're already contractually obligated to a certain amount, but I'm just wondering if there's an ask today. Uh, thank you through your worship. Yep, it, yes, the uh, the submission letter that was, I believe, provided within the agenda um, has the full ask in it, uh, and it, the total ask, which includes the core, uh, the core operations budget, municipal drinking water source protection, uh, the invasive species program, now the sustainable Severin Sound uh, special project, uh, as well as your Honey Harbor monitoring piece, the total ask is 108,805. And as I mentioned, that is still, um, it, that was approved in the last budget sequence. You should also have um, the 2020 to 2024 uh, approved in principal budget from our board in the package. And uh, so that would show you where the, where the board had approved um, all of those costs for the next few years. And uh, so that's, uh, that is the ask. But as I mentioned, we don't know where our board is going to land uh, within uh, some of the budget revisions that will be happening uh, for their review prior to the end of, well, hopefully the end of this month, um, early in September. Thank you very much. I was thinking after reading the package, you were here today asking for something in addition to what we had, but that's a great explanation. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. So I'm going to say, Ms. Kaley, thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate all the information. And we're looking forward to an update after your board finalizes your, num your projected numbers for next year. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Boutiet, do you have any additional comments or any uh, other community requests that you want to pass on to us at this time? Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so in total, we had six organizations who submitted, and I would like to say it was a very tight time frame. So I thank all those who took the time to fill out the uh, request form. Um, and that's six organizations plus the SSEA. Um, so today we heard from three of those organizations. So three others um, ticked off that they would like to uh, not have a delegation. So I did advise them that they would have equal opportunity all of the documentation will be put in the council portal. Um, so we created a folder in there where all of the budget related information will be placed for council viewing and uh, staff access as well. Uh, so this is new this year um, for your benefit. If you wish to review, everything will be together um, in a nice a bundle of uh, budget. So all of the requests, all of the presentation, a summary, all the questions uh, posed today. Um, so just to mention the other three, um, MACTIR, 
um, community organization is requesting a gazebo construction. Um, the Georgian Bay Forever has two separate projects, uh, Divert and Capture 2.0 of 1,000, and also Fighting Phragmites of 25,000. And the Georgian Bay General Hospital is requesting a $10,000 gift for upgrades to uh, their critical uh, equipment. Um, so all of those will be placed in the portal before end of next week, um, along with some of the uh, beginning of uh, staff uh, staff requests for uh, 2021 projects, uh, whether they are operational or capital. So I'm not sure, I'm not gonna make a presentation on behalf of those other three organizations. I'm not in a position to speak about that, uh, but if there's any other questions about uh, how we're gonna proceed for budget moving forward, uh, always available either here to answer questions or uh, via email or text. All right, thank you very much. I see Councillor Bocek has his hand up before I even ask. Thanks for giving us the opportunity, Julie, to ask you questions. However, my question may be directed more at the CAO or at the chair. Um, in the past, and I'm talking about since I came on council, these delegations were always done at the Committee of the Whole. And the Committee of the Whole is a committee that allows us to work outside of the Roberts rules and, and have a bit of a conversation that is not so formal. Uh, I've noticed since this council has come in, there's been very few or none committee of the whole meetings. Um, and normally this, this type of delegations would come to the committee of the whole, and then recommendations would come from the committee of the whole to council in order to entertain the funding. I'm wondering why we have skipped by all those procedures and it could be just because of COVID-19, but I do enjoy the committee of the whole meetings. It gives us a real fruitful opportunity to dive into these things uh, head first. So perhaps somebody could answer me why the change. Uh, I can let you know, Councillor Bocek, that later on we're gonna be having that exact discussion about committee of the whole and staff's recommendation that it'll no longer have it. Um, the way we did it this go round with the budget, it's more of a time saver because we talk about things at committee of the whole then a month goes by. And then we have the exact same conversation again a month later. So this does save time in staff's opinion, but um, there's no difference as to where it's being presented because staff is still gonna come back next month with the information from the delegations today. Well, thank you for that. Um, it's the, the committee of the whole basically gave council uh, a time period to digest and investigate before it came to council for a decision. When we, entertain these delegations at council, there is the ability to approve those uh, funding requests at this time, instead of allowing it through the process through the committee of the whole. So I was just interested in why the procedure change and, and, and uh, why we weren't up to speed with the procedure change, but you've told me it's coming and there's some, some new ideas. So I'm sure that will have to be approved by council and, and we'll move forward from there. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very it's, much. The, it's one of the last items on your today's agenda, actually. 9E at this point. Okay, any, uh, Councilor Rianco. Um, just on um, the, the GBF, um, they've asked for uh, more money uh, for next year. Um, it's, since it's a sizable amount, um, is it possible to get an update uh, from them um, possibly in September or October about the results from last year. Um, I always like to see uh, how our money is spent, uh, especially when there's a large amount that we give to the GBS. So um, it would be nice to see what they did with our money last year before we give them more money next year. So can uh, somebody take an action to have them give us a, a delegation sometime in September or October? So we have an idea how our money was spent last year before we go ahead to next year. Ms. Boutier. Yes, through you, Your Worship. Absolutely. They have requested that as well. So right now they're right in the bulk of their work and they don't have the tallied results yet. Um, and yes, they have asked uh, for a delegation uh, and we discussed a tentative date of October. So um, it is intended that they do come back with the results at that point in time. And just because I am new to the game, um, I've also asked um, 
SSEA to provide me with some numbers from the past so that I could uh, get a better handle on, you know, what we have done since we um, uh, signed the agreement. I just wanted to share that with Council that uh, as soon as I've got those numbers tallied to see, you know, how funding from our municipality versus also compared to the other uh, partners um, I'm going to put that in the council portal so that you guys can see the progress over time since we last signed the agreement. Sorry, that wasn't relating to Georgia Bay Forever, but uh, it's still, for me, it was important to grasp uh, how we've progressed with that partnership. Thank you. Car Councillor Jarvis, I believe I saw your hand up. Thank you. Um, to our Director of Finance, um, further to what you just stated, would it be possible within your... Um, uh, uh, notes to us uh, regarding these requests that we get a uh, some historical perspective on what they've asked for in the past and what we've provided uh, just so we have an idea of sort of where things have been going uh, some of these requests may be totally new anyway but uh, I know that in a lot of cases historical society uh, uh, and a number of the other associations SSEA there's been a I know they've been asking, they, we've been providing funding for quite some time for a number of them. So I'm curious, curious to know where that, where the trend is there and, and how it's, uh, uh, yeah, what we've been giving them. Thank you. Councilor Cooper. Another request for Julie, and that is, could you bring some clarity uh, with the information you're gonna put on our website with respect to uh, A, who signs um, agreements with SSEA? and B, when they have been signed, because as I'm understanding from what I'm hearing today is that there's a new, new period, a new contract from 2021 to 2024, I believe it is. So I'd like to know about that and uh, um, what our options are in terms of um, uh, contracts like that. Uh, specifically as it pertains to the testing that's going on in Honey Harbor, because now we're duplicating our testing. So I uh, think we need to give some consideration to that. So if you could perhaps give us some more uh, background on that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised. Oh, now I do. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Just to clarify for Councillor Cooper, I did hear those dates in the presentation, but there has been no new agreement. I can add to that. So the uh, the last agreement is a bylaw that was signed in 2004, um, and it is approved by Council through a bylaw. So what the, those dates that she was talking about were uh, a budget of kind of a project period uh, so that doesn't require a new agreement so the agreement is uh, it, it's a uh, I I'm not sure the time frame but uh, I know that the last time it was signed was around 2004. Councilor Cooper. Well I appreciate the clarification and so we're talking about something that transpired uh, 16 years ago and uh, it's not coming back to council, it sounds like, other than we hear about a, you know, a contract we have uh, signed 16 years ago. I'm suggesting that we need to have, uh, we need to look at that and think about um, re-signing or not re-signing. So that would be my suggestion when we get to the approval process for this particular program. Thank you. Councillor Douglas. Uh, I would agree with Councillor Cooper. I, I, I think there's a little bit of, um, um, not mystery, but unknowns around the last time this was signed and, and where we stand. And, and now that we have a number of different programs going, uh, I, I too would also like to know uh, what our contract is, whether it's still existing or where we stand with all of these groups, because duplication is something that um, really don't need doing and we do have quite a few I'd like to know where we stand with with our contracts with everyone if I could get clear okay uh, Councillor Douglas you broke up partially through that but I think the, your, your message is clear to everyone um, Councillor Bocek Julie just a quick question in some of these asks for funding um, I'm going to use the Cognacine uh, Church in the Freddie Channel, for example. Um, the funding ask there, would that be issued in kind? 
In other words, um, we wouldn't want to fund an organization where the money goes into the general coffers and used for something other than what was requested. So my understanding of when you issue funding in kind is they more or less um, prove what the money was spent on. They submit bills uh, and we pay out as, as, the, as the bills come in or, or, or something along those lines. I'm just wondering if I know with uh, in my past dealings with organizations I've been involved with, uh, that we did accrue funding from the township, we had to submit the bills in order to get our funding uh, to prove that we spent the money where we said we were going to spend it. So I'm wondering if there's any thought of, of that moving forward. Ms. Butia. Yes, through you, Your Worship. So uh, definitely, uh, and, and I wouldn't say in kind, in kind is kind of like, um, like if you supply labor or materials direct from the township. So I think what you're referring to would be a conditional funding. And that is definitely a, an option of council to be able to put restrictions and the method of payment. So once we uh, council approves any of these uh, applications, we would definitely do some kind of contract and determine um, what, what kind of mechanism we would put in place to ensure that our that the funding went to the right place and we could also put in that uh, little funding agreement uh, how to report back to council that's great thank you for your answer appreciate it okay now i think i'm oh of course council jarvis uh the, the mention of the congress community church uh sparked something for me um the uh, I know that Bill talked to me before making a presentation to council, and uh, I fully understand his concern having just replaced one of my dock the floats in one of my docks with similar for similar reasons. And uh, I think this is a huge issue up and down the bay. I know that a number of umbrella organizations are looking at trying to find uh, government funding from higher up to, to help people get rid of this foam. So, um, I think it would be good for us to make sure that there uh, we look into uh, other possible uh, sources of funding on behalf of these organizations. This is going to become a big thing if we, um, and I'm using Cognizant Community Church as the example, uh, because I know we have uh, helped them indirectly through the CCA in the past. And I think that we've got to be very careful how we uh, approve if we approve similar this type of thing because they'll be asked from all over uh, when this starts coming uh, as people realize the foam is a huge issue and it's got to be taken care of but I know that for instance in Ontario there is a trillium fund I don't know if it's applicable in this type of a situation but we've got to make sure that we've covered all our bases before we uh, approve this type of funding it's a huge ask uh, but it's a huge environmental issue thanks thank you now I'm, still, now I'm seeing no hands raised, so I'm going to say thank you very much, uh, Ms. Boutiette, for coordinating these delegations and, and this uh, uh, start to our whole lengthy budget process. And with that, I want to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is specifically the um, consent agenda. Um, and that would read... Be it resolved, the council adopts a consent agenda of August 11th, 2020 as circulated. Is there anything that anyone wants to hold from the consent agenda or should we just, should I just call for the vote? I'm seeing no hands raised. So I say all those in favor. Okay, that is carried. And uh, oh, Brian's rejoined us and voted as well. So that is carried. So the consent agenda has been approved. So the next step in our procedures would be, well, I gotta skip these one moment. Our clerk is very thorough, sometimes more than we need, thankfully. Um, right now, the motion for the regular agenda reads, be it resolved that council adopts regular agenda of August 11th, 2020 as amended to include 10C, parking at White Falls Road and 10D parking at McRae Lake. So those two items would be added to the two that we already have under new business that were introduced by Councillor Hazelton. 
Any discussions around the regular agenda? And before we get into the topic we discussed at the beginning of the meeting. Councilor Rianco. We're gonna talk, we gonna talk about uh, 10B? Yes, but I, was, I wanted to see if there's any other items first and then we'll get to 10B. Okay. okay. But at this point, I don't see anybody raising their hand. So now we we'll return to the topic of 10B. And that was where Councillor Hazelton was introducing discussion around the MECP approval of the Brandy's Cove uh, septic system. And as you know, we have um, Ms. Brandon, uh, Ms. Cheryl Brandon wishes to speak on to that item. And so we have three options in front of us, I would say, and, and if I missed one, please add it in. One option is to approve the agenda as is without Ms. Brandon speaking. Second option would be to be approve the agenda as is with Ms. Brandon speaking. And the third option would be to remove that item from the agenda. Councillor Bocek. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be the first to chime up on this. Um, I would, I would like to see uh, Michelle Brandon be allowed to speak at this meeting um, because of COVID-19 and, and a few other things. Our processes are completely mixed up. Uh, people are not having the opportunity to speak. So I'm voting in favor of having uh, the party speak. And if not, I am, I am going to um, ask that this be removed from the agenda. Thank you. One of the two for me. Councillor Rianco, followed by Councillor Cooper. I guess my uh, question, if you can, uh, do we have to do a vote on this? And if so, do we need two thirds majority or just majority? Ms. Way. Um, whether we remove it from the agenda or not is just majority. If we ask for Ms. Brandy or Ms. Brandon to speak, then that requires a majority vote. So five members in favor of. Well, either way, I'd like to see her speak. Uh, whoops. The option number three, uh, uh, Mayor, is that if you remove it, um, she could come back at a later date and do a delegation. Um, if, 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 um, and then uh, you could have a delegation, then we can talk about it. So there's, there's an option there that uh, you can put it off until September if, if uh, we can bring it back to the delegation. But I'd rather do it today. It sounds like a, a topic that should be discussed today, but I, I like to hear both sides of the issue, not just one side. I like to hear both sides of the issue before I, I can decide on, on, on where to. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Yes, to the point that Councillor Wianco is making, I would like to hear both sides. And I do believe that uh, Councillor Hazelton is presenting a subject. I'm not sure that he is one side or the other necessarily. I mean, obviously we've read his report, but I think uh, in the interest of uh, uh, fairness to all members of the public, not just one other member of the public, everybody should have a chance. So I would support today either dealing with it uh, without anybody else speaking or that we have to entertain and hear from uh, the broader community and the representative from uh, Brandy's uh, Marina, Brandy's Cove Marina. Thank you. Councilor Jarvis. I'm gonna echo Councilor Cooper's thoughts on this. I think um, if uh, we give one person the opportunity to speak to us, I think we should be opening it up for the public. And I would wager that there are a number of people in the uh, area of Brandy Scove that would also like to speak to it and would feel uh, that somehow they've been left out by allowing just uh, one person to speak to it today. So uh, my thinking is, I, I, it's a simple, to me, it's a pretty simple resolution about the ERB. Um, and uh, so I'm thinking, okay, let's deal with it from without, with uh, Councillor Hazelton's. Uh, resolution and leave it that way or open it up to everybody and which would be to postpone it. 
Okay, my, my, my concern, quite frankly, opening up to everybody means we're debating whether or not there should be a septic system there. And I don't believe that's the subject matter of Councillor Hazleton's um, item. I think, I think if I, and, and Councillor Hazleton, I wish you would respond to me when I, after I put this out here, but I, I, my understanding of what the, the item that Councillor Hazel putting before us was to ask for a review of the MECP um, uh, assessment of that uh, system, not uh, to have an open to the, the general public debate on whether or not they want a system, because I think that's a whole separate, whole different level. And I, and I don't believe that was the intent of Councillor Hazelton's um, item, but Councillor Hazelton, can you confirm or deny, please? <clears throat> sure, let me say a couple of things first, though. Um, as councillors, <clears throat> we have the, uh, the right and the responsibility to bring matters forward that our constituents are concerned about. We have items C and D that have been brought forward because other councillors are very concerned about them uh, because their constituents have told them they have been concerned about them. Uh, there has never in four decades been any public process on the Brandy's Cove expansions or anything. My motion is not to debate a septic system. It's not to, be, to debate the merits of a septic system. Uh, and as Councillor Jarvis pointed out, it is simply uh, to uh, provide a path of transparency, which we have not had on this matter, a path of transparency that would allow us as a township to fully understand what has gone on and why there has been no uh, environmental review on this uh, current uh, ECA, on the 2017 ECA, which um, appears to have been issued in questionable status. And so for anyone, for any councillor to think for a second that we should ignore our community. Yesterday, Councillor Bocek, you spoke up and said, we need to listen to our community, respect their interests and take action. And all I am doing here is I'm not representing any personal matters. I'm not representing any personal opinions. All I'm trying to do is provide a path to transparency on this. And if Cheryl Brandon wants to talk about the transparency path for this matter, then I'm quite happy to have her talk about it. Um, but hopefully there is going to be no discussion on the merits of a septic system, only the fact that there has been no uh, community process involved in this scenario. There has been no transparency. And this is the first time, as I said, in about four decades that the community has had an opportunity to even try to be heard. And the community uh, have responded. Uh, over 88 people have been contacted in that South Honey Harbor area and 98% of them have been very much in favor of an open transparent process. So I cannot imagine for a second why anybody would choose to vote against this process. It's not trying to turn anything down. Yeah, it's not hey, trying to. You, we, this was not supposed to be an, uh, a reason for you to argue on our vote. It was whether or not it actually was supposed to be part of the agenda. So when, it, when if the topic remains on the agenda, we, we know you've now already made your presentation. I have not made the presentation. What I wanted to do is if we're going to debate whether that topic should be on the agenda, then that's really what we are debating. It's not a simple. Okay. Um, Councilor Douglas. Um, so I, I do feel that we should listen, you know, allow Cheryl Brandon to speak. Uh, hopefully she will, um, and I'm sure this conversation will be kept under control as Mayor Coutier has indicated. Hopefully she will provide some additional information that may help in that transparency of uh, what uh, Councillor Hazelton is is perhaps requesting. I, I think it's important. I mean, there, maybe that information just isn't there. And I don't think that we, um, although our constituents would like us to do this, I, I do think that the owners should be involved in this. And perhaps she has information for us today that will help and will will be um, something that uh, they are very much interested in working with the community on. And for that reason, I think we should allow her to speak. If we feel that it's uh, something that we needs to go further afield where other people wish to put their comments in or send letters, 
we could always defer it and not make any decisions today. But I, I do feel that it's probably important we hear from Cheryl Brandon um, because she could be very much uh, offering something that's positive for the community in transparency. Okay, so the before we approve the agenda, I do have a, a um, resolution drafted in front of me that reads, be it resolved that council waive the rules of procedure to permit a member of the public to speak and address members of council as part of the new business for Ms. Cheryl Brandon from Brandy's Cove during item 10B, which is the Brandy's Cove uh, item introduced by Councillor Hazelton. Um, Ms. Way, could you confirm for me, at one point earlier, you said we would need five votes in favor of this as opposed to the, the normal majority of four, is that correct? Correct. We need five votes. Yeah, you need a majority vote because you're waiving the rules of procedure. But the majority vote is four people, is it not on a council of seven? No, that that's 50%. Okay, but so, so this is, I, I mean, I, 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 okay, so. Maybe my math is wrong. <laughs> Maybe well, Jessica has a comment, but I, I believe well, it was five. It reads majority vote, but five out of seven is more than a majority. So that's why I just wanted to confirm before we call a vote. I think because in the procedural bylaw, it'll say two thirds or majority. Thank you. So in this case, it's a two thirds vote. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I want that clarification. So at this point, if Miss, the for in order for Miss Cheryl Brandon to speak to this item we would need five councillors voting in favor of her speaking to this item. Should I, are you ready for me to call that vote? I see no hands up saying no. So it reads, be it resolved that council waive the rules of procedure to permit a member of the public to speak and address members of council as part of the new business for Ms. Cheryl Brandon from Brandy's Cove during item 10B, Brandy's Cove, Councillor Hazelton. All those in favor of Mr. Brandon speaking? Well, I count one, two, three. I see three votes there. I would have voted four, but that's not five. Therefore, this motion is defeated. Okay, so now, now that we have that behind us, um, then um, the next question would be, um, I guess, the regular agenda. And the regular agenda, uh, be it resolved that Council adopts the regular agenda of August 11th, 2020, as amended to include 10C, parking at White Falls Road, and 10D, parking at McRae Lake. Councillor Winko, did you have a question? I, Sorry. I have a question to the motion. Um, can we, def we haven't talked about deferring uh, the Brandy Island to another month and having a delegation. Okay. Is that something we can talk about or is that uh, the question? That's absolutely what we can talk about at this point because we're, we're talking about approving the agenda. So it, it's an item on the agenda. Uh, CEO Gunby, did you wish to speak? Sorry, my clerk head just popped up. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to say you could easily talk about that when the matter comes up, or you could remove it from the agenda entirely. So approving, you know, approving the agenda would mean if we don't make a change, the item's still on the agenda. But at the time of the discussion, we could discuss and or defer and or remove. Councillor Bocek. Paul, okay. I'm going to let Councillor Bocek. I'm going to let Clerk Way speak before you do because she might give us a technical thing that could affect your what you're going to say. Sorry, I was just going to clarify that the ability to defer um, is the mayor's decision. So you have the right to defer if you so choose without having to vote. Okay. Councilor Bocek. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I really have no interest in hearing one side without the ability to, to, to uh, refute. Um, it's almost like going to a a, a hearing or a justice where there's no prosecutor. So I have no appetite for this whatsoever. Um, so I would request that it is removed from the agenda, that item. 
until okay. we have the opportunity to, to I have it had no opportunity outside of a quick email from the respondent the the, the, the from Brandy's Island uh, detailing that there's a more information that there's information that um, has come through as recent as yesterday that we won't be privy to unless she speaks so there's a lot of conjecture and there's going to be a lot of hearsay evidence I'm not really interested in, in uh, entertaining this so I'm requesting that this item be removed from the agenda until such a time that we have a proper form to hear all sides of it. Councillor Cooper. Strikes me that we just had a vote on this issue. The matter should be heard. Well, we, we had a vote on whether or not Ms. Brandon would be heard today on this item. Any other councillor wish to speak to this? Councillor Jarvis, followed by Councillor Bochuk. Yeah, I, listen, we're looking at a simple, the, the resolution, read the resolution, everybody, before we uh, go any further on this. I think it's uh, pretty clear in Al's resolution what we need. And I think um, having a posting on the um, EBR, that's the Environmental Bill of Rights, is, is significant uh, when it comes to situations like this. And it didn't happen. So if we want to open this up to more public discussion, and I have no opposition to that, the best way to do that is to get more information out. And the best way to do that is to pass this resolution in the first place, is my thinking right off the bat. So as soon as we get this on the table and discuss it, then we can figure out where we want to go from there. I think we need to deal with it uh, as a council, not, not in the public as a council and then make it open if we deem necessary uh, for public, uh, for the public discourse. Yeah, I mean, and, and uh, I, I think you've raised a valid point, Councillor Jarvis, in that the motion itself reads in part, request the ministry to review the issuance of the ECA. Um, th th therefore that, that, that is, it, to me, it's, it's a narrow request. And, and I think that's important. Um, anybody else want to speak to this? Okay, I'm going to call the vote at this point, and that is to approve the agenda uh, as circulated and then amended to include items 10C and 10D, both around parking. So I'm going to now say all those in favor of the agenda. One, two, three, and I make four, and we got three people who are not voting. So it's a four to three for the agenda as it is. And then the, the contentious item, when the item comes up, we can discuss at that point how we, how we feel it's appropriate to respond to it. All right, it's, it's um, 11.30. I'm gonna suggest a five minute bio break and then we're gonna get back, we're gonna get into communications from the council and from the CAO and some of the staff reports before taking a lunch break. So five minutes, thank you.